It's bounded um, at the north by the southern tip of Adelaide Island, Pokwapa Island here, uh, the Worthy Ice Shelf in the south, the entrance to uh, George the Sixth Sound down here, and the northern extremity of Alexander the First Island. Okay. Um, this is what was known of the area in 1905. So we've got the bay area down here. We're heading south down here. I uh, just want to flash back to that first slide. So bay area here, bay area here. Um, Adelaide Island, uh, well this, to begin with, this chart was produced by uh, Jean-Baptiste Charcot. He was a French explorer. Um, this was produced after his first French Antarctic expedition, um, 1903 to 1905, aboard the ship, the Francais. Um, he operated, you can see here, in the peninsula region, in the areas that we're going to be visiting. So uh, a very, very um, prominent uh, expedition um, and very relevant to our expedition. Um, he pressed south and saw the, um, the northern promontory of Adelaide Island. He actually ran aground there. Um, but Adelaide Island, uh, which we're sort of uh, headed for the southern end, was discovered by um, Bisco, John Bisco, in 1832, so quite a lot earlier than uh, Charcot here in 1903-1905. Um, Charcot also saw Alexander the first land uh, as well, but that was again cited much earlier by Fabian von Bellingshausen in 1821. Um, Charcot came back to the peninsula region for a second expedition in 1908-1910, and this is a simplified version of his track on board the vessel the Porqua Park. Um, again, he was focused on the west side of the peninsula. Again, he managed to actually press much farther south into Marguerite Bay and provided some early charts of the region. So this was one of those charts. He was substantially able to substantially chart Adelaide Island, this time pressed into where we're expecting to come into tomorrow, um, Bay Marguerite. Uh, here's a close-up, which he named after his wife. And this was in January 1909. So, um, again, uh, Marguerite Bay, uh, Charco is coming out of the area towards the, the latter part of his expedition and sights land again. This time he names it Charco Land. Um, he was not uh, into himself at all. His crew insisted that he named it Charco Land um, and others as well, uh, not just the crew, but he um, did so with the intention that he was to honor his father uh, who was a prominent and very well-known, famous uh, French physician uh, who actually left him large sums of money, 400,000 gold francs, when he died, and that funded, um, largely funded, uh, his first expedition down here. So that was to honour his father. Um, moving a little forward, um, this is a chart from 1932. Um, it is basically outlining all of the major, or all, every expedition, even sealing and whaling voyages, uh, in the 20th century up until 1930. But if I just zoom in a little bit on it, what's particularly interesting is that it um, depicts the, uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, not as a peninsula at all, but rather an archipelago, so eastward openings into the Weddell Sea. Um, this was largely due to uh, the early aviators who arrived in 1928 and started flights down from the South Shetlands. Um, they were seeing what they thought were eastward openings into the Weddell Sea. So the, uh, the, the notion that the peninsula was an archipelago re-emerged onto charts um, around this time, 1930. Um, these were the suggested uh, eastward openings into the Weddell Sea, where I've just put these arrows. Um, a couple of years later, uh, this chart was um, depicting uh, again, what people thought of the geography of the area. So 1934, this time, this chart was actually produced in a book called Southern Lights. Um, it's an account of the BGLE, the British Graham Land Expedition, which was run from 1934 through to 1937. So two overwinters in the Antarctic and two summers of substantial fieldwork. Primarily, uh, or most uh, relevant to, to where we're going tomorrow, um, and the, the following day here in Marguerite Bay, um, it was conducted actually by an Australian, it was led by an Australian, John Riddick Rymill. Uh, he was from Panola. Uh, here he is on the left, pictured with Edward Bingham, another key member of the sledging, uh, the sledging trips um, that would 
form such a dominant part of this expedition. Um, they used a ship, they named it the Panola, uh, so a traditional sailing ship, um, similar to the Heroic Age, but they also used um, a plane, here's a de Havilland Fox Moth, it's a 150 horsepower single engine plane, um, and of course, uh, sledge dog teams, again, just like the, uh, the Heroic Age. One addition that they had that was a little bit more recent development was uh, the use of radio, and that was a significant um, addition to their, their plans. And here's the, the Havilland Fox Moth on its skis uh, on the sea ice. You'll note a flag here in the ice. Um, during reconnaissance trips, um, the plane would often drop um, flags on its route with uh, steel uh, spikes at the end um, to mark runways and mark uh, routes and, and depot areas for the sledge teams. Obviously, if those uh, steel um, spiked flags would go through the ice, they would probably depict it as not safe to land on, and that's how they would judge whether the ice might be thick enough to land on just by dropping these out and seeing what happened. Um, here's a rather 